The USS Monavine is having a spot of engine trouble. Agamus launched a bunch of red aliens into a hundred years war. And I don't get what all the negativity is about. Everybody loves black licorice, right? Oh, gosh. I do. Yeah. I love black licorice. <laughs> Me too. It's the black jelly beans, black licorice, <laughs> black cats, whatever. Hey, everybody, and welcome hey. to the seventh rule with Ciroc Lofton, <laughs> by the way. Who hates black licorice. What? Uh, <laughs> we are joined oh, by... The most special of all guests, Mr. Jeffrey Combs, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. No, stop, please. Stop. stop. Legendary. Legendary. (laughs) The greatest of all greats. Uh, My name is Ryan T. Husk, and I am extremely excited about this. So let's just get right into it. This is Lower Decks Season 2, Episode 7, Where Pleasant Fountains Lie. And Jeff Combs, you just continue to blow us all away the fans are were super excited when they heard the announcement that you were going to be in this episode and i personally was super excited every time that little black and red box started speaking and i got to picture (laughs) jeff combs's face making all these hilarious sounds and funny lines (laughs) Yes. Uh, I've had to keep my mouth shut for a long time about this. I did it maybe, uh, you know, months ago. And uh, zippy zippy NDAs can't say anything. (laughs) But uh, but it's there. And I turned out really well. I I got a screener. You know, I don't have access to Paramount Plus. Uh, that platform um and maybe i should and uh and so i just really enjoyed it you never know with these things you go in a you know it's really different now with voiceover stuff you know the protocols are really safe and it's actually the safest because there's like nobody around you you Mm -hmm. you literally walk from your car with a mask into a room hepa filter going Nobody's in there. Everybody's behind glass or on a Zoom screen that you can look at, and uh, it's just you. And that's safe, but it's not optimum for mm-hmm. voiceover because a lot of the time those are, uh, you know, there's a group of actors and you're bouncing off of each other. Acting is reacting, and it's like you're kind of in a little imaginary bubble of <laughs> how are they saying that? I have no idea. What's the tone of this thing? I don't yeah. know. Well, uh, is this, are they tongue in cheek here? Or are they taking this? I just don't know. So a lot of, a lot of just like flying by the seat of your pants with this stuff. Mm. Turned out great though. I was <laughs> really, I was really happy with uh, that. I, that I sort of, um, it's kind of like music. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I I found the key. I found the key they were in. Okay, good. I'm, I fit in sort of. Oh, you fit in all right. Um, you've always fit in and not just fit in, but uh, been exceptional and shine brilliantly um, from your you know, body of work and all of your contribution to Star Trek, I think, has been fat, phenomenal. And mm-hmm. um, Ryan and I are rewatching Deep Space Nine, so we get to see you as uh, Wei Yoon. We've yeah. seen you as Brunt. Um, uh, it's an embarrassment uh, of riches. Uh, <laughs> have you seen in the cards yet, Sirac? That's one that we we we, we did together mm. in the cards. Uh, yeah, and and you all, we also did uh, Far Beyond the Stars together, which you oh. got to play a uh, non makeup actor, which was great. Uh, I know for a day, for a day, <laughs> I didn't have a, a four o'clock call in the morning. Uh, Wow. You remember right. that was like all night. That was a night shoot, man, on the back night lot shoot. of New York, just hanging out. It was, it was we were in heaven though. And um and Avery Avery was never better as a director mm. than on that episode. Uh what that's one of my favorites of all of Star Trek. It is transcendent. And because of Avery and and his performance in front and behind the camera. He was just a phenomenal. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the script also brought out the best uh, of all of our performance because it just allowed us to kind of be these characters. Oh, you were great in that. You know, you were just this street kid who just were, you were at the mercy of your conditions. You know, you were doing the best with what you had, with the opportunities afforded mm-hmm. you. And, 
you know, it was one of those uh, potential lost situations, heartbreaking. Uh, just yeah. really one of the things that turned Avery's character just flipped him, you know? It's great. Great episode all around. So very proud of being part of Deep Space Nine. You have no idea. Well, we really hope to have you back sometime to do an episode or 10 of Deep Space Nine with us because as yeah. Strock mentioned, we are blown away every single time we see you. I mean, well, we could talk about it more uh, another time, but needless to say, when Sorok and I are watching you, we're very impressed. And as you know, I'm sure you know, the fans are constantly clamoring for you and about you. Um, uh, and in this episode today, everybody has been at a frenzy because they've seen your previous work as Wei Yoon, as Brunt, as Shran, as the guy on Voyager whose name I don't remember. Uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Pank. Pink, Pink. Right, right. Pink. How, how Pink. could I forget? Well, <laughs> uh, crumbs. But so anyway, when you mentioned, you know, trying to meet the tone, obviously that's nearly impossible to meet the tone if you're just talking basically to yourself. Uh, yeah. it's, it sounds nearly impossible. Did you go in with an idea of exactly what you wanted to do and you just kind of did that 10 times? Was there a director saying, try it like this or try it like that? Or did you just give every line in a few different zany or wacky or creepy or excited ways and let them pick what they wanted? I'd say a kind of a combination of that. You know, you kind of go in with like, eh, I think I want to try this. and But I got to stay open because maybe that's not what they want. Um, mm. You, you got to kind of go by the script. You read it and you you get sort of the, the uh, vibe of the, of, of the piece, uh, you know. What I loved about Lower Decks is it's just sort of this rapid fire uh, mm -hmm. pattern, real fast. Sometimes the jokes are past you before you go, wait, oh, what? Oh, but we're on to the next one here. It's very, mm -hmm. um, very clever that way, witty, very sort of quick banter. Uh, and it, so I just kind of, well, okay, that's what they're doing. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and, and uh, it didn't didn't make any sense to to, to me to do anything else. I, you know, I got some direction from them, and and um, but I think pretty much they kind of felt like I was sort of definitely in the ballpark with what I came with. And yeah, I did. Like uh, you know, I'll give you three of that one. You know, I'll give you three versions of that line. And you know, sometimes all three were basically not much different but then sometimes it was and so you know it gave i gave them options i guess mm. uh, what they what they went with i thought was pretty much what i was kind of going for myself so i'm really happy with that you know sometimes we see actors and they they're they're playing in these different roles and you're like it's the same guy in all these different movies like it's not there's no change you know yeah. and you're, some, but, you just do the same thing but with you you play all these different parts and it's like completely different. This personality is so different than this other guy. And um, how, do you, how do you get that, that path? Yeah, I, thanks for that. You know, early on, I was taught versatility would give you a, you know, a career. Uh, but then you come to Hollywood and then you kind of hit this wall of, oh, wait a minute. They just want that thing that they know that I do. Right? Like, you know, think about it like sitcom actors. Some sitcom actors are really good actors, but they're stuck with this stigma of, oh, you do sitcoms. So mm -hmm. if we need you for a sitcom, we'll call you. And it's sort of a, a um, categorization that we always, as actors, have to fight against, you know? Like, no, wait a minute. I'll tell you, Star Trek allowed me to tap into the ability to be versatile with the just you know the production value around me i can't do i can't do this without bob blackman the wardrobe guy mm. i can't do this without mike westmore I, I i simply cannot do it without that kind of top drawer of support uh, it's a team and and uh that's what's so great about 
it's a lot harder to try to delineate a character when let's say you're on a uh, low, lower budget independent film and you know you've got some ideas and they go yeah but we don't have the budget for that you know <laughs> and you go well okay right moving on to plan b uh so i, I just you know without that support I, I really couldn't be able to do it now with this one you know i didn't have that stuff it's just vocally i just didn't i wanted to make sure it didn't sound like Wayun. And it didn't sound like Shran. Uh, it wouldn't sound like Brunt, not without teeth in my mouth. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Brunt FCA. So, but it, so I, <laughs> so 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 I just sort of tried to find, uh, you know, something that was um, tonally right. You mm -hmm. know, fast talking BS artist. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> What it is about you, Jeff, uh, when I'm when I'm watching you or when I'm listening to you or what I expected when it was announced that you were going to play, you know, a, a character on the show, you don't take any lines off. You don't take any words off. Every single line is delivered in a new and fresh and interesting way that most people would not come up with or imagine or or do. I mean, even when, like, like when there's the pause in the episode, you know, blueberry muffins, and he says, stop. And you go, guacamole, or I'm not even going to try to do the way you said it. I listened to it. <laughs> I went back and listened to it five times. I'm like, only Jeff Combs could say guacamole five times, or so funny that I could hear it five times and laugh every time. I know. I, I thank you for that. I appreciate <laughs> it. You know, it starts with kind of clever writing. You know, mm -hmm. you can tell right away with that. Well, this is going to fairly fly along and and just jump in and uh, play. I love that word. Uh, you know, it has a newer, more modern connotation. But actors back in Shakespeare's time were not called actors. That word didn't even exist. They were players. Mm -hmm. I really like that word, players, because that's what you do with acting. You you're playing. It, it there's a, there's a uh, a connotation of fun there and uh, actors it just seems to take itself mm -hmm. so seriously now you know player is uh doesn't mean that at all <laughs> anymore it means something else, <laughs> something else completely different and that's uh you know words change meanings of words change yeah yeah i've always thought uh the most the utmost respect for you uh You've always been just a consummate professional, always prepared, um, just a, a pleasure to be around. Um, and I think that's why you've had such a long career as well, not just your talent, but because of your personality. It was so fun to talk to and be around and so quick witted. So you just pick up on so many things uh, all the time. Well, thank you, Sirak. I, you know, I have golden memories of... Uh being on set and hanging with you guys, you, you and Aaron, you were always seemed to be teamed up there whenever I was around. And I, I, yeah. I just uh, was like, oh, good, I get to play with the boys because you were boys-ish. <laughs> you were yeah. a young man. I'm sure you were uh, doing very adult things at that time, but, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, but it was, it, it, it was a real joy to be with you guys. Uh, we had such a, we still do, we have a, I, I think of it as a family, mm, yeah. Deep Space Nine, and the, the cast, and the and the, uh, and the bench. That's the way I think of all the supporting actors. Like you know, uh oh, we need a hit. You yeah. know, Andy, grab a bat. You know, <laughs> or uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, or uh, Casey, you're up at bat. You know, Jeff, you're on deck. Okay. So meanwhile, you guys so were. At home, <laughs> at the pool, enjoying yourself. <laughs> no, I don't know about. That. I don't know about that. I have a lot of work to do. Um, but this this is like your eighth or seventh or eighth different character, and I think you have to be on top of the list of most characters played. Ah, uh, 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 don't do that to Von Armstrong. You no, know, Von Armstrong has done twelve yeah. different twelve characters, okay. but you know they weren't 
all of them were not like uh, recurring. They were like oneers, you, you know, but okay. still all kinds of different aliens and from humans to Klingons to Cardassians to uh, that guy, you know, what, what can you say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what was so great about Deep Space Nine, the deep bench. Yeah, is this the first time you you've played a, a robot or a computer? Yeah, yes, it is the first time that I've played <laughs> an evil computer. And you know, people have been asking me that have been interviewing me, what's it like to play yet another evil computer in the Star Trek <laughs> realm? And I'm going, oh, wait, 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 there were other evil computers? I guess, yeah, I guess there were. I guess so. Uh, did you do any research on that? Like, um, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> it did not this is a completely different kind of evil computer i don't i didn't play him evil i just played him desperately charming to try to get somebody just plug him in hey i have an idea you know it's, it's kind of pathetic it's kind of pathetic but funny jeff it was do you do i don't i don't because i don't believe you do do you have you done a lot of voiceover gigs because you really obviously your your voice and your talents lend themselves to decades of future voiceover work. I, don't I, know. I have. I have done quite a bit. Um, I um, Way, way, way back, uh, uh, I got a call from my regular agents, my theatrical agents, uh, for an inquiry about a, a voiceover. And I did uh, Scarecrow in a Batman. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, People still talk about that one. I was like, really? Yeah. And then a little while later, <laughs> the same thing happened again with uh, Justice League Unlimited, which was a wonderful uh, animated series. And I played The Question. And people really love what I did with The Question. I've, I've done Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've done Scooby-Doo. And I was like a series regular for three years on uh, Transformers Prime. So oh, I played... Wow. I played Ratchet. I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, let me tell you, that was going to school, uh, being in a room with the great Frank Welker and Peter Cullen standing right next to me and all of these other primo voiceover actors in that wow. room. Mm, it was really great. So I've, I've done my share of voiceover, but I'm not the most, um, I'm not the most uh, versatile vocally. I mean, Literally, there are people that can play four roles and you wouldn't know it. And I'm just, uh, that's maybe not me, but mm. it's a skill set. It's a whole other uh, lane that you really have to learn the ins and outs of. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've, I've done some. I'd like to continue to do it because you know what? You don't have to get up at 430 in the morning. You don't really have to learn the lines. You just have to familiarize yourself with the lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're done in four hours. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, okay. What a deal. <laughs> I know. You can wear sweatpants. <laughs> you can be comfortable. Yeah. Well, that doesn't that doesn't mean it's not challenging. It it certainly has its own uh uh responsibilities, you know. It is really hard to focus everything about your character into a vocal choice. Mm. Sort of like, oh boy, everything's gotta come this way and no other way. I have a question now. Uh, when you're recording this stuff, is the uh, animated part of it already done, or are you watching the stuff and no. like putting your voice over it? Or no, no, okay. uh, no. Usually, no. Uh, the, the, okay. Sometimes they'll give you a visual reference, like this is what your character looks like, and they'll put up a, a drawing. Okay. Uh, you know, they maybe gave you a description of of the character like kind of like they do with sides, you know, Ciroc, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. But but you only get to see the visuals when it comes to, let's say, uh, when you have to do ADR, looping, mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. things like after it's, uh, after it's created, then you, you, you do get to see some stuff. But, 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 you know, you've already done your work at that point. <laughs> it's like, right. you're just fitting in stuff so no you don't really get a lot of um and, and as far as the evil computer what are they going to show me 
a box with a red light on it. <laughs> that's what made, that's what I was laughing about when Sarag asked that question as if you were going to say, you know, I'm having a yeah. problem oh, really I, harnessing I, the, I, Can I have a visual <laughs> reference? And they go, sure, yeah, here I, it is, a black box. Okay. <laughs> go what get I was going to do, but now I do that I've seen this red box. <laughs> It wouldn't have helped me. Very much. It, was it was all on the page. It really was. It was just, you know, well, well, well written, witty dialogue. Uh, so, so Jeff, when you saw the yeah. screener, presume, presuming you did, and you yes. saw the, the final product, mm -hmm. was there one line in particular that you thought that's, that's my best line or that you're most proud of that you, that made, you made yourself laugh or you, you were just impressed by yourself yet again? Well, I, you know, I was trying to find variations on the same thing here with like trying to talk these people into just plugging me in. I can help. Uh, and I, on one line, I chose to whisper it, you know, you know, just just plug me in and the world will be yours. Or I don't remember what the line was. <laughs> but it was kind of like I'm going to like try whispering in their ear. That'll get them to, you know. Yeah. I, you know, I kind of like that choice. It's kind of everything's so fast. You don't. It kind of reminded me of a Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny cartoon. It was just so like, mm. whoa, wait, what? You know, when you're a kid, some of those jokes go right over your head. <laughs> and then later, you go, oh, right, uh, that's an adult joke. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clever. I, I I really like Lower Decks. I, I, I only seen snippets, so the screener was the first full-on full episode. Was, yeah, as Ryan and I re review the show, we say that they pack so much stuff into this yeah. twenty-five minutes uh, animated series that it's like the notes for it are just as long or longer than the notes of the full hour-long right. uh, shows that we review. And, and yeah. I'd also say that um, they do that on purpose, I think, because. You know, we all know that 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 the pace of Star Trek and the tone of Star Trek is a little more serious a lot of the time. And it's sort of reality, even though it's sci-fi fantasy, it is sort of based in human uh, modes of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's like, uh, uh, like amped. You, you know, it's really like, almost like it's not a farce. But it's really at a at a different pace, and I really it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of shakes up the whole Star Trek universe with a with a completely different uh, attack. You know, I liked it, Jeff. Uh, obviously, your character is not dead. That little black box is locked away. And by the way, shout out to the Daystrom Institute. That was really cool that they said that. Um, yes. So they've left the door open for your character coming back, possibly. Is that, I'm sure that may not have been something that they discussed, but have you considered that maybe you'll be getting a call in the future to reprise that role or maybe another one? And how quickly would you say yes? Well, uh, let me think about it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I had a really, I had a good, I had a really good time. Uh, it's uh, who, who wouldn't want to, do that again, especially uh, the way it turned out. So uh, I'm here. Uh, I'd look forward to it. And, uh, you know, I'm happy the fans are happy. I'm happy they're happy. Um, it's good. It's good to be back uh, working in the mm. Star Trek realm. You know, a lot of it is um, gone to another country. And it sure. sort of keeps us uh, um, marginalized. So, uh, there's a little bit of frustration for all of us, you know, all of us that live here on the left coast. It's like, wait, what? Wait, hey, what are we? Chop liver here? Uh, it seems strange. It seems strange. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of like your cousin took over the business. It's like, wait, 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 hey. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, I love those shows, but they're they're just different. They're mm -hmm. a completely different approach and they're a completely different geography uh completely different pool of actors completely different crew it's uh it is an another quadrant do you feel like Doing lower so. decks is a little bit more recognizable to you to the to the old star trek than the others yes in some ways but just because it's so 
whack swashbuckling. You know, the the original <laughs> series, everybody was, you know, some of those sets were pretty cheesy, but you went with it. And what really sold it was just the outrageous commitment of those actors. We <laughs> no, I this pack. I don't know my lines. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> explain. That was a pretty good Jane way, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, uh, you know, it's got some of that to it. Kind of a kind of kind of, kind of a swagger about it, and I, I really like that. Sometimes, uh, sometimes some iterations of Star Trek can take itself a little too seriously, mm. you know. And I, 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 I like the spice. I like the spice because they're leaning into this stuff, and I really like that. Yeah, you mentioned that. I mean, I, I think you brought it up when you said that uh, you, you know, the terminology of actor versus player. And when I watch you yeah. perform, I I do sense the playfulness that you have with these characters. I feel like you're having fun. I feel I like am. you're playing with them. Yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I am. Uh, that's the only way to sort of uh, be full of it, be full of life or shit, but be full of it, you know, commit, <laughs> go full on. Uh it's boring to lay back. Uh, you're here for a reason. Um, and so elevate. Yeah. So uh, can I tell you a story that uh, maybe I've told it before you before that Avery told me one time when he was directing me, Sir Yeah. So this is the best director's note I've ever gotten. And it's from Avery. Okay. It, Mr. Mr. Miles Davis of Star Trek. Mm completely different guy when he's directing than when he's you're acting with him i don't know if you ever noticed that but it was a different hat completely so i'm doing brunt and i had a speech action i do it avery gets out of the chair and he walks up to me and he goes we're going to do another one and uh slalom and he walked away <laughs> and I went, slalom? What is that? <laughs> it was like jazz, jazz meets downhill skiing here. It's like slalom, slalom. And then it hit me. I know exactly what, I know what he means. I know what he means. He means just to hit those flags. You know the course. Just put it together and just go. Don't break it up. Go. Hit, let the flags hit your shoulder and go. One word. And I knew oh. what he meant. And that's really, that's really an actor knowing how to talk to another actor. It was oblique, but very specific. And I did one more take and he went, yeah, let's go. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Slalom. That's a great Slalom. one. Slalom. Uh, so to this day, I say that to myself often hmm. before a take or something. Slalom. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. Um, actually, I remember having a conversation with uh, Avery about you, and I, I said, Jeffrey Combs, and, and he said, I think it's pronounced Coombs, and I, I'd like you to clarify that for me. I, is it originally uh -huh. pronounced? Well, there's some... What's the word have yeah, well, Avery is uh, incorrect on that, but not really. There are there is another version of my name with two O's in it, and Brits can't help themselves. Even when they see my name written in print, they say Mr. Coombs, and I say, well, <laughs> you know, okay, is there an O on that? Because two O's, you know, you know it's like you comb your hair with two combs. You know, but so he's, he's right. There is there is a version that's Coombs, uh, but uh, I'm not it. So it's OK. Mm. So, OK, so you can go back and slap him upside the head. Say, <laughs> I don't know about that, but 
<laughs> I'll clarify it. Well, you could tell him slalom. You could just. I'll tell him like, slalom. By the way, Mr. Combs says slalom. <laughs> slalom. That's right. He'll be like, I don't remember that at all. He won't. He won't remember that at all. I'm sure he will. Yeah, I'm sure he will. No, that's 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 a great direction, though. It's it, it's funny how just one word. Uh, I'm sure it just left you kind of a little puzzled, like what this. But well, is, what is, just like you're doing right now, I went, what the? Fuck? And then I went, oh, right, right. Oh, of course. Yeah, I know what you mean. Instead of using 10 words, like, listen, just, you know this, put it all together and just let's do another one and just, you know, you, you got it. Yeah. You got it. You know, that kind of slalom. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> just the economy, the economy, you know? <laughs> It was, it was priceless. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, we just have a minute left before uh, we've got to wrap up for our break, and we know that you have to go, oh. Mr. Mr. Combs. Um, yeah. But <laughs> this has been really great. We do hope you come back and see us some other time when we're reviewing Deep Space Nine or when we're reviewing your next episode of Lower Decks or your appearance as a crazy alien in Picard or, you know, all of the things Guys, that are I would coming love, up I, I would love to do it. Anytime you, uh, you know, need a filler, let me know. I, I, um, I just have nothing but great memories of all my time in Star Trek. And, uh, and, and I really appreciate this. And mm. uh, I'm glad to be sort of uh, back in the saddle, at least, at least in an animated version here. And I hope everybody enjoys the show. And, um, uh, Maybe I'll be back, but yeah. who knows? That's that's not my um, that's not my call, as we all know, as actors, right? Sirak, it's kind of like, when are you going to be? Da, da, da? And you go, well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Listen, you tell you me. You got to be asked. <laughs> if I got to be asked to dance, excuse me, would, can I yeah. dance? You like to dance? That's you know, it's not up to us. Yeah. Why aren't you on? You know, it's like, well, because uh, I'm not a producer. Maybe I don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate this, guys. Thanks. You made my day here. And on it's behalf of all the fans, oh, by the way, job. yes, we absolutely loved your performance. Uh, Star Trek knows how great you are, and Paramount knows how amazing you are, and the producers get it. But the fans have been clamoring and demanding for you. I'm sure you know, they they were trying to get you on to uh, Strange New Worlds. We're trying to get you on Discovery. I know, and I I just kind of laid low and went, look, uh, that's like, chances are slim to none and slim left town, guys. If it were shot here, maybe, but maybe not. Anyway, I appreciate it. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. We'll keep yeah. Our fingers crossed. You can never get enough uh, Jeff Combs, and somebody's got to catch Vaughn Armstrong. So you're yeah. the closest contender. Well, he's, right. <laughs> he's hearing footsteps. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, like the Giants, right. hearing footsteps with the Dodgers, but maybe we can't seem to. Oh. See, this is where you and I disagree, and I'm very sorry. Oh, you're a Giants fan? <laughs> yeah, Lolita yeah. and I were talking some I, jive about you a couple of days ago with the Dodgers hat. <laughs> but listen, I can appreciate it. I have, for, you know, I grew up on the Central Coast, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. ha on the coast, Central meaning halfway between San Francisco mm -hmm. and L.A. And so half of my friends were Giants fans to this day. And, you know, we give each other... That's what that's what we're supposed to do. Is we're supposed to. Give that's, each the other. <laughs> that's, that's the rule. That's the rule, and that, and that's what being a fan is is all about. But this has been an extraordinary year with them. It's been very civil, actually. Yeah, There's not a once. lot of trash talk going on because you know we're trying to catch, and they're looking over their shoulder trying to stay ahead. It's a tight one, and that's the way it should be. Mm. I guess I should have worn way, orange we'll, instead of blue today, but whatever. Either way, we'll see you in the playoffs. Yes. Either way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, we could talk baseball forever. Strock and I are always talking basketball, but uh, everybody else is like, we don't care. We just want to hear more Jeff Combs impressions of his own well, character. <laughs> I, I would point out there is a baseball connection here. There was Very a much. baseball on uh, – 
on Captain Cisco's desk uh, for for seven years. Mm -hmm. I always loved that. So and take uh, me out to the Hollow Suite, yeah. one of the best episodes ever. Absolutely, I wish I were in it. I wish I were in that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, oh, well. yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. We really appreciate it. You guys are the best. Onward. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, I'll be back. Nice. I hope I can come back onto your uh, onto your show here. Absolutely. Open and invite. Plus. Yep. Open invitation. Yep. All right. Uh, and everybody right, at home, we'll see you on the other side. So stick around on the seventh rule, and uh, follow Jeff on Twitter and tell him how in incredible he was in this episode and all the others. And uh, well, we do hope to see him on a future episode of any Paramount version of Star Trek. See you on the dodged other side. Another bullet. I dodged another <laughs> bullet. <laughs> See you on the other side. Hey everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. Nice. That was energetic. Uh, we are also joined by Lambda Quadrants Callie Wright, also a uh, podcast that you have called Queer Splaining, right, Callie? That is correct. So check that out, yeah. everybody. But right now, it is time to get back into Lower Decks, back into this episode, because there's so much, like Sorak and I always say, our notes for this episode of Lower Decks, they're always like a mile long. So <laughs> let's hit them all. Let's knock them all out like Greg Luganis. I don't know. Is that a thing? That, is that is, No, that's no. not a, no, that's not a knock. Wasn't he a diver? He was a diver. And yeah, he, he was hit a his diver. head, but boy, he yeah, knocked that's... stuff out uh, quickly. Uh, no, I just oh, mean man. like he. That got dark. No, <laughs> I, I didn't mean like he knocked himself out. I meant like he was when he would knock things off his to do list. But anyway, take two. Um, yeah. Hey, Kelly Wright's here, everybody. <laughs> so, people are gonna be talking about you on Twitter, man. It's gonna go down. <laughs> oh, people on Twitter do not talk shit about people. That I'm not worried. <laughs> Twitter is the most wonderful. <laughs> not Twitter. <laughs> anyway, let's start off by saying Dr. Ta'ana is in your background. What's up with that? Oh, I just, I love her so much. Uh, mm -hmm. She is the, uh, or, uh, do we go for a PG-13 vibe on the show? Rated R vibe on the show? How I mean, at this that? point, whatever, right? Okay, that's fair. I just, I want to respect. Jeez. She is the, she is the grumpy bitch I aspire to be in life um because she, she's such a quintessential star trek doctor and that like she really knows her stuff and she really does a good job taking care of people but she will complain about it the whole time uh and i just i love i love it so much and i just have this deep fascination with cations uh for some reason even though yep. like in universe we know so very little about them uh which we we did a couple of weeks ago we got to learn a little bit more about them which i'm very excited about um you have so, yeah. a, a uniform too i mean is that are you being dr ta'ana when you're wearing that uniform or are you being a I, tendy so i want to do to Anna, but I want to do it right. Like I want to have like an actual like orange cloth hood with the like a mask, and like I want to do that right. So that is in the plan. Like I even have the blue doctor's jacket for it. Mm. Um, I did tendy the Cincinnati Comic Expo was last weekend, and I did tendy. So I did the you know green face with the three dots, and I had my I had my T eighty eight and my purple stripe tricorder. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then and then. I, <laughs> And then in uh, in Vegas, I was doing, and, and no one got it, uh, but I did, you know, the trill on Lower Decks, uh, Barnes, she has the bigger, like, cartoon-like spots. Yeah. Like, I did those deliberately instead of the smaller spots, and nobody got it. Oh, like, well, that was I, such I, a I, deep cut. Star Trek fans got to get this. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, like, three or four people, like, oh, so what, uh, what, what are you, I'm like, a, a Lower Decks trill. Are you not, like, what are you, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so let's, Fine. speaking of which, let's talk about this episode. Sorak and I just got done praising Jeff for about 30 minutes, and we could praise him for about 30 more hours about how amazing he is and how great he was in this episode. Uh, but, Callie, how great do you think Jeff Combs was? I <laughs> love him so much. My only, and it's a cartoon, so you can't do it any other way but i did miss having his like physicality yes. uh because his physicality is so much of what he brings to the characters that he plays uh, like in ds9 and so i did miss that like having him as like a disembodied voice instead of uh uh you know a, a character that you can see on camera uh but it was i mean it was so good he he played the the sort of like 
deceptive, smart, like smooth operator thing so well. It was just, I, they're, yeah. uh, I, I don't know that they could have picked a better person for, <laughs> for the character that he plays in this episode. Yeah. Now, Sirach, you and Callie, both of you, were you picturing Jeff's face when he was doing funny or interesting lines? Because I would, every once in a while, when he'd say something crazy like that, like that guacamole line I mentioned before, like, I was picturing, I was like, okay, I know the face he made. I've seen Jeff Combs enough. <laughs> and that made me laugh even more was, was seeing in my mind's eye the, the funny face he was making or how he contorted himself. I mean, I missed seeing it on screen, but could you guys picture it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always picturing him because, you know, he's got a unique voice where you're like instantly yeah. going to recognize his voice. And on top of that, there were lines that he delivered that were hilarious. Like one where uh, he says, clearly you should be the captain. And he was trying to suck up <laughs> to the guy. So he, <laughs> and I was just like, this guy's good. He's just, he's, 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 he's trying any way. Suck, the suck up way, the manipulation way, the, Hey, I have an idea. Why don't you just leave me over next to this spot? You know? And he, he was trying as many different ways as he could to uh, manipulate the situation. Um, so yeah, I'm always picturing Jeff Combs, but I, I kind of agree with Callie on that one because he does add so much because of the facial expressions he makes and the yeah. looks he gives with his yeah. eyes. So he does a whole lot of eye acting that is removed and that's one of his strengths. So, um, <clears throat> I definitely would like to see him also revived in one of these Star Trek incar uh, incarnations, which we get to see him play a character. Again, that would be um, a real yeah. treat as well. I'm still pressing for a short trek in which Jeffrey Combs plays every character. I think <laughs> that, oh, wow. Uh, that needs to happen. Because uh, I, I don't know how familiar with like Star Trek Twitter or any of like, it, but there's there is a joke that goes around like, oh, yeah, every character in Star Trek is played by Jeffrey Combs. Mm. Uh, so I think that would be really funny. And, you know, I wasn't mostly be because... I, I wasn't picturing him in my mind because when I'm watching something, it's really, especially when I'm watching it for the first time or the second time or the third time before it gets really familiar, it's really hard for me to analyze something while it's happening. And so in my mind, like that is just the disembodied computer voice of Jeffrey Combs saying all of those funny things. And to <laughs> me, that actually makes it funnier. Like that made it more enjoyable for me uh, that you know the the sort of like sneaky shifty like shady character yeah. is this disembodied computer voice but it's a voice that i like of course recognize because you can't not um so yeah i was not picturing it in my head but that's just because of like the specific way that i experience fiction <laughs> like ds9 mm -hmm. that i've seen you know dozens and dozens of times obviously i'm analyzing the hell out of that I'm, as i'm watching it now but new stuff i can't really do that with mm. yeah. you know um there are also a few uh, NAMs, non-appearance mentions in this. Uh, we got the Titan again, which I'm not even sure if we count ships, but they definitely do mention the Titan a lot. We got another data mention. Uh, they sure love mentioning data recently. Um, and Seven of Nine. I think that's the first time we heard them say, uh, yes, it is. First time we've seen or heard a mention of Seven of Nine. I don't know if you guys caught any others that I may have missed. I don't think so. I th the the one tiny little off uh, off offhand comment that really got me is that apparently we find out that Boimler is a podcaster, <laughs> like a twenty fourth century version of a podcaster. Uh, I miss he's that. Like He's like, he's in the beginning, he's like, you know, shining his phaser rifle and Mariner's like giving him crap for it. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go down to this planet. It's going to be great for, I forget exactly what he calls it, but basically he insinuates that he has like the 24th century version of a travel podcast. Oh my God, uh, that's hilarious. Like, oh, this is going to be great for this. And I was like, of course they would make <laughs> him the one who is like blogger, <laughs> content right. creator. <laughs> right. He's got two listeners. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that's his that's his pickup line. You know, I I'm a podcaster, so you know, maybe you want to hang out with me. I'm a podcaster, and I was on the Titans. Yeah, so. yeah. Let me tell you about the Titans some more. Uh, I thought that was funny. Mar Mariner was like, "Enough about the Titan already." <laughs> she she calls it his study abroad program, which I died. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Now, another uh, line wow. uh, that Agamus said uh, that cracked me up, speaking of Mariner, um, there are a lot of lines that I thought he had really great delivery. It was, but this was definitely one was when he said, my scans indicate you could lose a couple pounds anyway, <laughs> but it was mostly like the way he said it yeah. that just killed me. I love, I just love his delivery and everything. And obviously, yeah, I don't, I didn't write down her response, but her response was also excellent. It was again, not the line itself wasn't terribly funny, but just the way she delivered it with, with disgust and annoyance. Hey, Callie, Jeff and I like black licorice. Ciroc says no. Can we put this away once and for all? Yes, right? Black licorice is good, comma, actually. Yep. Oh, comma, God. actually, in case you were wondering. <laughs> punctuation there. I love you, Ciroc, <laughs> but I think you're wrong, my friend. I'm so. going to, we should, we should start calling it not for blacks licorice. <laughs> so, so is that a I, thing? Think, I think it's a black thing. Because okay. I don't know any people that like black licorice. We eat the red vines. We eat red licorice. I just don't know any black people eating black licorice. So Have you the ever name been... is deceptive. <laughs> it's deceptive. <laughs> have you ever been on any set ever that didn't have the big jug of red vines? Uh, no, they all have they red vines. They all do, but, no, but they never have the, uh, the black vines? I don't no, know. Okay. Nobody, eats, nobody eats black licorice except well, for... Well, we're going to find people. out. Everybody. I was going to say, in fairness, in, in fairness, black people, white people, any kind of people, I don't know many people at all that like black licorice, to be That's fair. True. Yeah. My, all my French yeah, family I, loves the, the black licorice, especially like the unsweetened, like super intense stuff. Oh, I should oh, show you some of that. It's like, it's just like eating tar or like motor uh, yeah, oil. I don't, know about, I don't know about unsweetened. Oh, so you love eating motor oil. Got it. Okay. Mm. I learned oh, a thing so about it, it, it's one of the alcohols, like a licorice type of taste, like a uh, Jägermeister. Uh, Jägermeister or, yeah. mm -hmm. is, isn't it Jägermeister? It and tastes kind of like a Sambuca too, licorice. Sambuca. And, and I can't stand either one of those, just for the record. It, just the alcohol <laughs> version even bothers me. All right, but this uh, is a question just for the black people in the audience, <laughs> both of you. Uh, is what Ciroc is saying true that black people don't like yeah. black licorice? Because right now, when you said that, I started yeah. racking my brain. I was like, shit, I don't know if any, I don't know if I know any yeah. black people who like black licorice. You may be honest. No. You, you may be yeah, frankly, people. I don't think I know anyone besides me that likes it. So. <laughs> Mm. No, no. Yeah, shape. the smell is it's it's, it's just ugh. I actually okay. wrote it in my notes. Black licorice. Uh I, mean, <laughs> I actually had to write it in my notes. <laughs> it was the perfect thing to pick for that scene though, right? Like because I feel like even somebody like me, like I, I do enjoy black licorice. I'm not joking about that, but I also understand that most people yeah. don't. And so it was still just a really funny thing that like when the replicator malfunctions, that's what it gives you. Like, yeah, it's probably right. gonna keep you alive, but you're going to have a bad time. Um, whereas, you know, I, I feel like in a in a more traditional Star Trek show, that wouldn't have been a plot point, right? The replicator would just be broken. <laughs> but, right. like, but in Lower Decks, it's like, oh, yeah, it works fine. It's just going to only give you something terrible. <laughs> and, I, and I like Mariner's line. She said, the least nutritious thing that tastes the most like poison. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's this. That's what I think of when I think of it. That's actually funny. Yep. And clearly Mariner, a black person, another anime. Oh, one shit, these, you're right. <laughs> That's another point. Does it like black? <laughs> All right, well, just <laughs> so you guys point. know, I just, just in that time, I just texted three of my buddies to ask them, three of the black variety. So far, the first one has <laughs> yes. already responded. Big no from me. So it's another point in Ciroc's <laughs> camp right now. <laughs> I'm by the, I'm by the end of this. Survey says. <laughs> yeah, survey says. Ding. 100 people said no. <laughs> 100 out of 100. Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> but there was a whole nother plot line to this. I guess the main story, the other oh, story right. was the this. This Billups, right? Lieutenant Billups and the, the Ren Fair and, and the virginity issue and all of that. I thought that was kind of Billups must uh, be I was like, at all costs. God, I love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that what was, was his, a funny little what was thing. his mom's name? I think Chauncey, right? Oh gosh. No, no, no. I kept focusing on the fact that his <laughs> first name is Andorithio, I think. Right, right. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, oh wow! I, yeah, Andorithio. Yeah, 
I had I had sort of mixed feelings about that plot line until I thought about it for a minute <laughs> because I was thinking like Ren Fair culture is not my thing, but I have friends who are super, super into Ren Fairs. And so I have like a tangential familiarity with Ren Fair culture. And, you know, they set up this premise where like you have to have had sex in order to be in a leadership position. And I was like, are they like wow. making a joke about how few Ren Fair people have sex? Because if so, that's a sorely misinformed point of view. <laughs> 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 or are they like, trying to make a statement about how horny Renfair culture is, because that's what I know to be true about it <laughs> in, in terms of the people that I know. Um, and I, okay. like, I, thought that was a, I thought that was a really interesting plot line because, you know, asexuality is something that there is so little representation of anywhere. And I'm not asexual, but I have tons of friends who are, and I like, I want them to feel seen as much as I do by the queer and the, the trans and non-binary characters. Um, and so I immediately like texted uh, Anna, the, somebody else from Lambda Quadrant. She's ace. And I was right. like, hey, like, am I reading this right? Is 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 he our like Star Trek asexual icon? And she's like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, because like at first it's, it's a, a cultural pressure thing, right? He's like, no, I don't want to have sex because I don't want to be king. Uh, but later they kind of make a thing about how he's like really like physically not into it. Um, and I'm like, okay, so maybe right. he's, maybe he's our, he's our asexual character, which is rad. Like, I love that for my ace friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I did too. I thought it was, it was, uh, it was funny, especially when the, the, uh, the two people he was about to have sex with were kind of sitting there kind of like this while he's in the yeah. bathroom, like looking himself in the mirror. And I thought they were Warming so ready up. to get it on. Yep. <laughs> Oh, so ready and warming up <laughs> man i don't know what he was gonna do to oh. warm up but i did kind of expect like a joke like when he's leaving like the two sitting on the bed would be like okay well you want to just get it on you know like the two of them just be like okay well whatever you know yeah. you're still here i'm still here but yeah you know, such luck no they were waiting for the prince to show that he's more than just a royal stud <laughs> speaking of royal speaking of royal stud we got our second response to the uh liquor the, the flash licorice pole by our good uh -huh. buddy mr darnell davis um he made a joke though that maybe you know so we <laughs> he didn't okay. answer yes or no he made he made kind of a joke so we'll let him uh text a second i was i was gonna say but i was like you know maybe you better not better no, not so, so, so far okay. Our buddy Andre Cotman says, big no, Darnell, who knows? <laughs> well, we're really stirring up the pot with this black licorice topic. Right, who yeah. Knew that would be the highlight after all of the stuff they cover in this episode, right. that okay. that would be the thing. <laughs> See, look, okay, like right here, I've got two French black licorice things. One is cashew, right? Yeah. And the other one is gastrozon. And they're like super intense. Like they're just little black, like BBs that like they turn your whole mouth black and uh, black and stuff. I'll that. send like, you some, Ciroc. <laughs> you said it's, you said no, it's thank you. I don't, I don't think, I don't think I could get into that. Mm. I like a, I like, well, you got to let that get into you. <laughs> I try hey, it. Kelly, I I, I wanted to bring up the point that you brought up about the rent fairs and stuff, because what that, what I see Lower Decks doing a very good job of is kind of trolling it, the, the subculture of Star Trek. They're so good at trolling Star Trek itself. So they go back, they bring up old characters from every show, the, anim, the old animated stuff. But they also talk about like the collectible, the collectibles and, and you know, the auto. Uh, Boimler wanted an autograph for his plate, yep. you know, the data so they bomb. troll, <laughs> right, so they, um, this show, unlike any other, is doing a fantastic job of trolling its own fan base, and I, I think the, the call and the shout out to the Ren Fair stuff is also kind of saying, hey, we know a lot of our fans do this too, yep. just like we know they, they play, you know, live action, role-playing games, that we know that they do the Dungeons and Dragons stuff, so there's a lot of crossover on, you know, different, different areas. And so they like touching on these things a lot in lower decks. And I think it's kind of a fun thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what often makes for good comedy is 
that very simple setup, right? Because like if <clears throat> completely out of context, I say some Ren Faire folks went and started a, a colony somewhere and now they have a whole civilization, like immediately that's ripe for comedy, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't need in, in the context of a show that's 25 minutes, right? Like there has to be, there has to be a hook that this thing is inherently funny because there's no time to build context and make it funny, right? <clears throat> and right. the idea of an entire spacefaring civilization based on Ren Fairs, like I don't <laughs> need to be told why that's hilarious because even though that's not my specific kind of nerdery, like I am that kind of a nerd about Star Trek. And so like, I get right. it on that level. And you can just tell that it's very obviously made by people who are nerds like we are nerds. Uh, and I don't think something has to be in order to be good, but I think in order to be good the way Lower Decks is, it does. Like, I feel so seen as a Star Trek fan in mm-hmm. every episode. Yes. But what's also great is my wife is a very casual Star Trek fan. Um, like, we watch it together sometimes, and she likes it, but she it's not like her life like it is mine. And she still absolutely loves it, even though she doesn't get most of the, like, references and inside jokes. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I I don't either, but I yeah. still enjoy Lower Decks a lot mm-hmm. because they the, the writing is so clever. I mean, uh, I, I like, for example, when they were trying to look at the mechanics of the Ren Faire ship, and he's like, <laughs> "The dragon's blood flame," you know. <laughs> <That's> so good. <laughs> and, and Rutherford is like, "What?" He's like, "Oh, we have to make everything sound like magic," you know. And, right, so, and then Rutherford then, tries to join. He's like, "He's like uh, the elf," and the, the, no, don't just <laughs> don't. <Yeah. laughs> But what I think what's so great about it is that, like, underneath all of the, like, silly references and comedy, like, it is real Star Trek, right? Like, these are real Star Trek characters in real Star Trek plots that use classic Trek-style problem-solving, right? Like, and, right. I mean, we see that even more. There's, like, so many subtle tropes that's like, oh, yeah, like, Star Trek always does this thing. When I watch Lower Decks, I'm like, oh, I see what that's about. I see what they're doing there. Um, and and that's the way that uh, Rutherford immediately sort of swi- tries to switch into being like, oh, okay, <laughs> like, with these people, I got to talk the way they do. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. The thing, right? It's just, it's so great. Uh, and then, like, thinking deeply about some of the character interactions uh like on the planet boimler actually like lays hands on mariner right yeah yeah i was wondering if that was actually going to happen because it looked like they're setting it up and they just they're just two starfleet officers battling it out in this you know in the context of the story it's before we know that it's an act Mm -hmm. and so like it kind of makes sense like he's actually been convinced by this computer of you know whatever's happening And then, you know, we find out it's all an act and it's like, wow, like he took that really far. I don't know that I like that. Like, you don't, you don't, (laughs) like, that's not cool. But then I think about, but then I think about Mariner and like, she's too smart. Like he had to do that to convince her that it was real. Right. Otherwise she would have known he was faking. Plus he's not worried that he'd be able to beat her up anyway. He's like, I'm sure she's going to kick my ass (laughs) with one broken arm too. (laughs) She's going to kick my ass for this. I'm going to. I'm yeah, going to get it's it. It's just a fracture. It's just yeah. a fracture. It's such a good line. It's just a mm. fracture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, so- I, I like the line evil computers are so chatty. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is. You have to, when you think back at evil computers, they're always talking a lot and like revealing their plan or, you mm-hmm. know, or trying, trying to have this really heart to heart conversation with whoever they're trying to take over. It's like, you got a real chatty computer, you know? So yes, well, I like I mean, that line of it. There are so many plots that would have gone differently if the bad guy would just not have explained what their plan was and like <laughs> the person, right? Like there's so many, so many plots right. that depend on the bad guy giving this big exposition of what their plans yeah. are. <laughs> You know, and we, see, and we see that at the end, like not to jump too far forward, but you know, when they put Agamus away, like all of the computers are just talking shit about how they're going to take everything over. <laughs> so, yeah, you yeah. know, I was expecting to see a computer or something that we recognize because Lower Decks really has us trained to practically assume that there's going to be some Easter eggs. Now, one thing I do want to mention our good buddy, Mr. Uh, Don Crandall, who always catches these things. He uh, mentioned that uh, the murderous computer 
or a computer that controls an entire planet in a negative way is mainly a original series cliche. He says, we saw it in original series episodes, The Return of Archons, I'm sorry, The Return of the Archons, The Apple, and For the World is Hollow, and I Have Touched the Sky. But he also mentioned something I hadn't even considered. He said Agamus's murder drones, remember when he's saying, I'll create some murder drones to destroy the whole planet or whatever. They look kind of like oh, Next oh, Generation's oh, oh. Arsenal yep. of Freedom, right? You remember that one? Yep. I, yep. I thought that. about that too. The uh, I forgot the name of the episode, but I remember because uh, it's early, early TNG that uh, I, I do visit sometimes, but not all the time. And it 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 does. It's like the the bigger head up top, the little scoop looking thing underneath. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Although I, I will say, I'm not the one who caught this. I saw somebody pointed out on Twitter, one of the evil computers has the CBS logo on it, I think. Unless that was a Photoshop that somebody <laughs> made. No, no way. That's, I, don't, I doubt that. I don't I'm going to have that. to go back and I'm going to have to go back and look, but some somebody said. Here's the murder <laughs> drone, Sirach, from a first season okay. Next Generation episode. Yeah. Okay. So the murder drone st- uh, theme has been used mm. before. Yeah. It, and one of the ways that, uh, <laughs> speaking of murderous computers, one of the ways that Riker finds out it's a, a computer is that uh, the computer like takes a form of someone he knows, and uh, and Riker's like, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm on the USS Lollipop," and the person who is supposedly his friend's like, "Oh yeah, the good ship Lollipop," and Riker's <laughs> like, "Okay, I'm just gonna yeah, got it." <laughs> great, great early TNG. Yeah. <laughs> So we only have a couple minutes left uh, because we're cramming a ton into one half hour portion, just like Lower Decks does. But we do always have time for Ciroc's favorite line of the episode. Oh, my favorite line of the episode You may have already given it. No, I haven't. This is it right here. I've been waiting for this question all my life. You can run your full diagnostic along yes. my bottom up. <laughs> yeah. How did I know? That's the one. That's the big money Love maker. Right? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't get it. But. <laughs> Would you like me to I, explain I it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, I, that, hands down, best line in this episode. I, I thought it was, I had to rewind it a few times because she kind of gives him the look like, and I was like, wow, this is a great line. Honorable mention for how, like, Ta'ana seemed to be right. genuinely sad to tell Tendi when they thought Rutherford was dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she has that yeah. look on her face. I'm yeah. like, oh, she's not going to be mean. That's that, And that makes me love yeah. her even more because that means that she is genuinely caring. Uh, by the way, quick poll. Yeah. Did either of you know what was happening immediately when the ship blew up and they're like, oh, my God, Rutherford's dead. Well, yeah. Well, we knew Rutherford was uh, going to be dead. Yeah. Well, he, he could have been dead, and then they brought him back to life, like they did Shaq. So I, I wasn't true. necessarily a hundred percent. So there was there was a possibility that they were dead. Um, so yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure. No, I wasn't sure. Were you? No, it took me a second. I forget. I forget exactly which moment it was. I think it was when uh, when Tendi is looking and she sees uh, she sees his uh, his headpiece, like and she's like still getting a reading. I was like, oh, okay, they faked it. So you know, because the the queen is yeah. like, because po- they did a lot of signaling. Like the queen pulls a lot of tricks. You know. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. That, right. That's that's one of the Star Trek tropes, right? Like they make an offhand reference to something at the beginning of the episode that turns out. Like in the beginning, it seems completely inconsequential, and it turns out to be like super vital to the plot at the end. Uh, the very, very yeah. classic trek trope that Lower Decks has adopted a lot, and I was like, has I I nailed. Guess. Right, you have to yeah. pay attention to every single line with Lower Decks. There are no wasted motions, no wasted lines. They're really good with that. And and shout out to that queen. I don't know who the actress was that played the queen, but very good voiceover work from her. Um, there are a yeah. lot of little extra people too that did some really good voiceover like the one Sirach mentioned from the bottom up uh that was also excellent but <laughs> all around uh, another great episode personally i enjoyed it very much it was fun yeah. it was uh quick you know fast paced lots of funny jokes lots of great delivery by mr jeff combs but also the rest of the crew did a great job and they had different storylines going right when dr taana was 
talking to Tandy for a moment, then Tandy goes and finds Rutherford. And before that, it's Rutherford and Billups. I mean, they do this great job of, of incorporating everybody and, and Mariner and Boimler have all their moments with Jeff. Pulling an A and B story together in 25 minutes is seriously mm-hmm. impressive work. Like that was a thing that I was worried about, like, you know, pre seeing any lower decks, it's like, wow, it's going to be shorter. Like, you know, like, how are they going to format the stories? And I, I, I found myself not even thinking about that at first, like in, in so many of the episodes where there's definitely an A and a B story mm-hmm. that, you know, Star Trek classically took 42, 43 minutes to do and like didn't always do perfectly well. I don't feel like Lower Decks has done a bad job of it yet, like managing no. two different stories in such a short time. Sometimes three. Yeah. Sometimes three. Yeah. I think this show has started off the best out of almost all of the series. They have hit the ground. They know their identity and they've hit the ground running and, and maybe they have the advantage of the shorter time. So they don't have to fill up an hour worth of stuff and stretch things out. Um, They also have the advantage of animation so they can kind of go anywhere they want and don't have to build any sets or whatever. But Mm -hmm. uh, the writing is clever. The voiceover work is great. And the whole thing, it moves along quickly. It's believable. You care about the characters. You identify with the characters. They they have their own personalities. Um, I also want to say that I think that the you've been boimed. (laughs) There was a line. Yes. Yes. (laughs) That just is going to be (laughs) I, th- I think that'll catch on. Uh, I think you've been boined will catch on um, soon. Have you boined so. us with the licorice talk? You really do like it, right? Uh, you've been <laughs> boined on that one. No, no, no. no. Oh, I don't like it. Damn. Uh, yeah. And then the other thing that was funny is when Artemis, uh, or Agamus. Argumus Prime. Uh, Argumus, yes. When he, uh, at the end, when he's like, I hook you up to the light switch. And he's like, well, I'll blind you. Yeah, (laughs) flickering. (laughs) So many little things, like when they're walking through the door, and he's got his little like tendrils trying to hold onto the door, like just like little little stuff like that. That like, you know, I don't know that I would have missed it if that wasn't a thing, but it definitely added to it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, and and honestly, like that's I think that's the thing that makes me love Lower Deck so much is that it feels so much like like it is real Star Trek. Right. Totally. Like it's not, yeah. it's not, a, it's not a parody. Um, yeah. it's, Cause I've heard people call it that. And I, I hate that. I would yeah, love, a good Star not. Trek, but lower decks is not that. It's not. Mm-hmm. No, it's an original. It's its own thing. Um, and really quickly, just for the record, because, because I know you guys know better than me. What, what is the reference to burying data's head? Um, I, uh, that one. Right. What was head. that episode? That was, uh, uh, Times arrow maybe. Well, so there's, so t- there's Times Arrow where they find his head beneath San Francisco and they end up going back in time and meeting uh, Mark Twain and all that whole thing. Yeah. And then uh, there is in um, uh, Nemesis, they find uh, yes. one of the brothers' heads buried Before. in the land. And yeah, and that's how they lure the Enterprise out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Mystery solved. All right. We got to run. Everybody at home, don't forget your homework. Black licorice. We got Darnell did end up texting back and saying that no, he doesn't like it either. So, so far we're just yes, waiting on Rico. Yes. I'll let you know as soon as Rico yes. responds. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, everybody at home, thank you all very much for joining in the fun. Leave us a comment below. Tell us all about black licorice or red vines or just about this episode and say what a great job Callie did. Tell us how much you enjoyed watching Jeff Combs. And by watching, I mean listening, really. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks very much, Callie. Yeah. You were awesome. Sirac, once again, good time Thank as you. always. We'll see you all very soon. And always remember the seventh rule.